Hello, welcome back to ESC 418A. This is Lecture 6B, Logical Fallacies. I'd like to start this lecture with a quote. This is from William Gladstone. Men are apt to mistake the strength of their feeling for the strength of their argument. The heated mind resents the chill touch and relentless scrutiny of logic. This is very true. Once somebody has become attached to an argument, it is very difficult to show them the error in their logic. And this isn't unique to any type of person or group of people. All humans tend to have a strong tendency towards confirmation bias, and we have a very difficult time seeing any flaws in our own logic. So this is a really important topic, not just for writing, but really in being a good scientist. So there are different types of logical fallacies that we'll go through. Logical fallacies in general are types of arguments that appear to be logical, but are not and these can be intentional or accidental, they might be appeals to emotion, they might be somewhat tricky, or they might just be a little bit clumsy, but essentially it's some type of an argument that somebody's putting forward that is illogical, and we need to sometimes look at the premise of the argument or look at what is happening within the structure of the sentence to try and understand where that logic is going. Usually the flawed reasoning is what leads to flawed statements. Sometimes it's intentional again, but sometimes it's just improper reasoning. And so logical fallacies are a way of thinking, not just a way of writing. So it's very difficult for us to self-identify some of these logical fallacies in our own writing. But hopefully this will help a little bit. Let's get started. So there are lots of different logical fallacies. There's uh, dozens of them anyway, but these are some of the main ones. And every source you go to will give you a slightly different list and some of them have slightly different names, but we'll go through these one at a time and I'll give you some alternate names and forms of each of them. So I've just picked alphabetical order. Again, these are, these are some of the most common ones. Most of these apply to scientific writing. For the examples I've used, I've used a lot of famous political statements because they really illustrate the fallacy, although these are used in everyday life, in scientific writing, in politics, and really all over the place where people are trying to argue for one position or another. So let's start with the ad hominem. This is an attack against the person. So instead of attacking a person's argument, you would attack that person, either their character or something else about them to try and downplay their overall argument. An example would be, Clearly, we can't trust a report that was produced by somebody who works for a dirty coal company. So this might be something that somebody would say about an environmental impact assessment about a coal company. If they didn't like the assessment, they would say, well, obviously that person was biased. We can't trust that report. So to spot or avoid this fallacy, focus on the argument and the data, not the person. A similar one is called to quote. And this is not used all that much in science writing. This is used a lot more in politics, but really it's referring to a person's hypocrisy to make a logical point or to downplay some other person's point. So how can you criticize our party for proroguing parliament when the opposition party also did this? So you'll hear this in politics all the time. It's related to the ad hominem, but slightly different. Moving down in alphabetical order, although this is quite a different fallacy, this is the ad populum or to the people also known as the bandwagon fallacy. In other words, if lots of people agree to this, it must be right. So alcohol can't be bad for you. Billions of people drink alcohol without any problems. Well, obviously this isn't true. There could also be billions of people who drink alcohol with problems. So just because billions of people are doing something doesn't mean it's right, and it doesn't mean it's logical. To spot or avoid this fallacy, we need to again focus on the argument and the data, not the popularity of something that people think about it. So it doesn't really matter if billions of people think something is right. It actually doesn't make it right. Focus on the data. That'll be the answer to a lot of these. Appeal to authority refers to the opinion of a respected authority or a famous person. So even Jennifer Aniston knows that the devastating bushfires in Australia last year were caused by climate change. Often we hear famous people. Sometimes they actually have true authority and sometimes they don't. Often it's somebody who's got a lot of fame or authority over one area, but then they overreach their authority or their fame and they go into some other area where they really have no credibility. So we need to really watch for this one. This happens in lots of areas of environmental science where people will give an opinion that they're certainly not qualified to, but they get amplified because of their fame for some other reason. 
So again, focus on the argument, not the person being cited or the person making a statement. Begging the claim, also known as a circular argument, in this case the premise is taken to be proof in itself. So you might hear somebody say, the Okanagan region is already under considerable water stress, not to mention the threat of climate change. It cannot tolerate one more withdrawal to irrigate another orchard. So this would be sort of a local resident arguing against an orchard getting a permit for a water supply. And it may or may not be true, actually. It might be true that the Okanagan Lake cannot tolerate one more water withdrawal. The point is, though, is that you need to actually look at the data and the lake and the water users on the lake, not just somebody's statement that says, we're already under stress, we can't tolerate one more. So challenge the premise before addressing the overall claim. Maybe what this person has said is actually true, maybe not. We need to actually look at that first before we address the entire claim being said here. Next, cherry picking, also known as card stacking. This happens a lot in environmental science, and it happens by all sorts of different parties. And really, it's selectively using evidence to support a broader claim. The example I'm, I'm giving here is, this is actually similar to a very famous example of a mine in Indonesia called Briex, where people had cherry-picked data or falsified data to make the entire mine look super valuable. So that was a major scandal in the 80s. The, uh, the example here is both of the core samples had over 25% copper. This mine will be worth billions. So in this case, the person has two samples and they're extrapolating that over the entire mine, which is, of course, ridiculous. But again, this type of thing happens all the time in environmental science because the environment is so heterogeneous, it's pretty easy to find a couple of samples that can support one claim, whereas the other 30,000 samples might show something entirely different. So you have to be really careful with cherry picking. The way to spot or avoid this one is to consider whether the information is broadly representative. And in environmental science, often a couple of samples will not be broadly representative. Next, false analogy, also known as weak analogy. So this means relying on an analogy between two situations that might not be comparable. And this happens a lot with industry. So the Quote I've got here, last time a pulp mill was developed on Okanagan Lake, it destroyed the local fish population. No new mill should ever be allowed. And you might hear somebody opposing a pulp mill saying a statement like this. And of course, this is actually not a good analogy. Virtually all industry that was built 40 years ago polluted and were fairly destructive to the environment. We have come a long way since then in terms of technology and regulations. So even though one mill on the banks of Okanagan Lake might seem kind of similar to another mill that was built on the banks of Okanagan Lake 40 years ago, we have to really look at the underlying factors when somebody brings up an analogy to understand whether one analogy is good. And again, just because we have a false analogy here doesn't mean it's also not correct. It might be true that one mill destroyed a fish population and another mill will do the same, but the point here is that one does not logically or necessarily mean that the other will as well. So we need to actually look at the underlying data and the underlying factors in that claim. Next is a false dichotomy. This is also known as the either-or fallacy. In other words, you have two choices, neither of which might be true choices, but somebody will put two choices to you and make you choose one or the other. And again, here's a nice one from politics. This is George W. Bush. You're either with us or you're with the terrorists. So frankly, you don't really need to be with either. This type of false dichotomy is put forth a lot in politics, but also sometimes in environmental science, you know, somebody will say, you must either approve or reject this project. But usually when it comes to large environmental projects, there's lots of variations that can be done, mitigations, kind of compromises that can be done in between the absolutes of completely cancelling it and completely approving it as proposed. So you really need to be careful with this one. There's almost never only two choices. Typically you can reject nearly all either or arguments. There's almost always some other option that you can go with. Next, hasty generalization, also known as stereotyping or cherry picking. Uh, cherry picking is a little bit different as I mentioned, but it can fall into this category also. So stereotyping is a form of hasty generalization, and we're all familiar with stereotyping in terms of people stereotyping each other, but the same type of reasoning can also apply to environmental science. So drawing conclusions from insufficient evidence. 
There are no endangered species in this region. Our site reconnaissance did not identify any. So we went out and did one survey. We've come home, we've written a report that says there are no endangered species anywhere, which is a broad overgeneralization. We don't have enough data to actually say that. All we can say is that we didn't find any, maybe based on some professional judgment or some statistics, we can say how likely it might be that there would be endangered species, but we've overgeneralized here and said there are none anywhere in the region, which is a hasty generalization. So to spot or avoid these, consider counter examples to any generalization. So in this case, a counter example would be, what if there was a single individual from an endangered species somewhere in the region that didn't happen to be in our path when we did our site reconnaissance? Would that nullify our argument? It sure would. So there is our counter argument. Next, moral equivalence. This conflates a minor transgression with a major atrocity. My instructor gave me an F on the proposal assignment. He is literally Hitler. So the point here is that we need to apply perspective to such arguments. This is a little bit similar to the false analogy. When we're comparing two things, we need to be careful about whether they are actually equivalent. Uh, this is the non sequitur. This is actually my favorite logical fallacy. This one can be hard to spot. These are often logical statements that have a nice logical structure and they come across or are disguised as a nice logical sequence. But often there's something about it that's not quite right. So one statement does not logically follow the other. So here's an example. It was raining all night last night, therefore I was unable to complete my assignment. So the point here is that there might actually be some logical connection between being unable to complete the assignment and the rain last night. You don't necessarily want to dismiss this out of hand. Sometimes you just want to seek more information. So in this case, it might turn out that it was raining all night and this person's sewer backed up and they had to evacuate their house and they were unable to complete the assignment. And therefore that would actually be, you know, a logical conclusion of having too much rain. But in this case, the information is just not provided to show that. And so non sequiturs can be often just improperly phrased, having not quite enough information. But often they're also a logical sequence in somebody's mind that is actually not a true logical statement. So we have to be careful about this one. So anytime you see, therefore, thus, hence, think to yourself, does this logically follow from the previous statement? Next, post hoc ergo propter hoc. After this, therefore, because of this. This is also known as the false cause. In other words, if B came after A, then B must have been caused by A. And this happens all the time in environmental science. The quote on the right is actually from a movie I saw when I was young. This was a true story. I don't know what the true environmental story here was, but according to the premise of the movie, a major power line was installed over a playground. Children were getting sick. Of course, they blamed the power company for this. And this, this is totally typical of any large industrial project. If a project is built and people start seeing adverse impacts, whether or not it's related to that industry is completely irrelevant in that person's mind. Another great example was uh, Weeble Ludwig from Northern Alberta. Uh, he ran a commune of a few families up just uh, west of Grand Prairie. There was a lot of oil and gas uh, development in his area and his cattle became sick and his daughter had a miscarriage. And this is a very famous story. He ended up getting, um, you know, sort of in big fights with the local residents and he was sabotaging oil and gas infrastructure. Some people ended up driving onto his property. Somebody on his property ended up shooting and killing somebody that had come onto his property. So this was a really famous case. This was probably about 25 years ago. But the whole point of this was uh, Weeble Ludwig and their, their commune had assumed that because they were seeing sicknesses on their property, they blamed it all on oil and gas. They went to the extent of sabotaging oil and gas. There's a book about this, by the way, called Saboteur. It's quite a fascinating story in environmental science. It's also where I grew up, so it's, it's kind of an interesting story to me. Sorry to digress, but that whole situation appears to have been a post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy because it's never been proven whether any of the harm to 
his cattle or his grandchildren were from oil and gas. It's entirely possible. But the problem was, is all of this went on just on that pure assumption and people ended up dying and um, a lot of industry was sabotaged and workers could have been hurt as well. It was, it was a very tragic story in the end, all over uh, an assumption that has never been verified to this day. So that's a long-winded way of saying we need to be really careful about this uh, logical fallacy. Just because one thing came first and the second thing came next and they seem to be connected doesn't mean there's any causal relationship at all. What I've said here is that timing can be an indication of causality, but it's certainly not proof. In this case, we need to look for other evidence to support or refute that claim. Another one is a red herring. These are interesting. Teachers, I remember, always used to put red herrings on the math test. They would put uh, some information that has nothing to do with the question to try and confuse you to see if you would try and take that information and put it into your formula. So the red herring is also a logical fallacy. It's a diversionary tactic that introduces information that is irrelevant to the argument. So something that is an answer to an argument or part of an argument that is completely irrelevant is also known as a red herring. I hear what you're saying about the pollution, but what about the jobs that will be lost? And so this is something politicians say all the time. We can't address this because we will lose out on this other thing over here. But of course, this is also a false dichotomy. But the jobs in this case are a red herring. It might or might not be true that jobs will be lost, but it doesn't address anything about the pollution that the person is asking about. So to spot or avoid this logical fallacy, return back to the original argument before addressing the irrelevant information. In other words, we might want to address the irrelevant information, but first we need to deal with the premise at hand. Slippery slope assumes that one action will lead to a series of following actions, usually ending up in some catastrophe. So this is a, another one that we see in all sorts of political debates where one party argues for the status quo and another party is arguing for change. So in this example, which is relevant because this happened a couple of years ago, Marijuana is legalized, next will be meth, and then will be fentanyl. Pretty soon we'll all be addicts. So this is, this is a typical political argument. It's certainly not a logical argument. There's nothing that says because cannabis is legal today, meth will be legal tomorrow, or fentanyl, or that we'll all become addicts. But this is the type of argument that, uh, that we see in politics. We also see this type of thing in environmental science as well. So we need to be careful about stopping these and showing that, you know, we're dealing with one condition here, whether or not anything else happens after that is a purely hypothetical. Is there evidence to suggest that one of those things will happen? Maybe, maybe not, but we have to evaluate them on their own merits. So do not assume or accept that subsequent steps are inevitable, unless we have some scientific evidence to show that, yes, indeed, one or more of these steps is inevitable. Special pleading. So this is making an exception to the rules, guidelines, or principles for oneself, usually out of emotion. This is one I've heard quite often. The BC Water Quality Guidelines apply to all lakes in the province, but this lake should have more stringent guidelines because it is special, and without saying special to me. So in other words, because I live on this lake, it's special, it should have special guidelines. Now we might hear this argument on the other end too. We might hear a proponent arguing that the guidelines don't apply because their site is special. If that is the case, there might be some reason for it, but it would have to be argued scientifically, not just out of, out of this special pleading case. So watch for any appeal to change the rules for me or for my party or for my client or for my whoever. The straw man argument. So this over, oversimplifies or misrepresents an opponent's argument, then destroys the straw man. So what this does usually is a person will restate an argument back to an opponent or preemptively state that argument to the opponent so that they can shoot it down. So in other words, it's like a straw man that you would put up to scare the scarecrows away. Knocking over a straw man is a pretty easy thing to do. Surprisingly though, this actually happens a lot and people seem to get away with it. So I've got a very famous quote here from George W. Bush. After 9-11, George W. Bush wanted to go and wage some war. And so he stated his enemies' arguments for them. They hate our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. 
I highly doubt that the uh, World Trade Center was taken down because somebody somewhere hated George W. Bush's freedom to vote and assemble. I really don't think that's what the war was over. Uh, but for some reason, politicians get away with making these types of statements, and um, here we are. So neither oversimplify opposing arguments nor allow yours to be misrepresented. So don't oversimplify your opponent's arguments. It doesn't really help you win an argument, and don't allow yours to be oversimplified either. If somebody oversimplifies your argument, you can calmly repeat back to them what your actual argument is and just point out that they're making a straw man argument. So that's it for logical fallacies. Again, this was a small sample of the many different types. These are probably the most common. Most of these are covered in the reading. So have a look at those. There's lots of different examples that'll help you understand these. Watch for logical fallacies when you're reading the newspaper, when you're reading advertisements, when you're reading scientific papers. They're really out there everywhere. Once you get used to seeing these, you'll actually see them everywhere. And uh, it's quite almost amusing sometimes to look at the simplification of some of these arguments that are made. So hopefully this helps you shift your thinking a little bit, not just your writing, but shift your thinking about how to present arguments. And uh, I hope you enjoy these as much as I do. So I'll see you in the next lecture.